Uh, welcome everybody. Um, let's start and hopefully we will all cool down even though it's a packed room. Um, thanks for coming so early in the morning and welcome to session 559, um, Interdisciplinary Approaches to Early Medieval Transitions. Um, on behalf of Emma, Erin and I, I'd like to thank all the speakers for coming um, and everybody else for coming to hear our session. It should be a very interesting day or half day of lots of different techniques, spanning archaeological science through the more traditional um, archaeological techniques to look at pretty much the whole of early me medieval Northwest Europe um, from roughly the end of the Roman period up to about 1100. So we're going to have some really interesting talks today. And I'll hand it over to Erin, who's chairing the first part of the session. Take away. Good morning. So first up, we have Miriam Kars, who is a researcher with the Portable Antiquity Scheme of the Netherlands. Thank you. Okay, well, um, this paper is about iron belt fittings of the 7th century, decorated with the so-called animal tooth style. And in this paper, I want to argue that these objects, which are almost exclusively known from graves, can be seen as symbols of a period in transition, and that this viewpoint may also apply to other uh, objects of the Merovingian period. Uh, the transition I'm referring to is the ongoing Christianization of early medieval Europe and in making my point about objects that played a part in this transition, I will first discuss how the study of, Mer of the Merovingian burial evidence among which the 7th century belt fitting has contributed to the debate on, Christ on the Christianization of Europe, uh, after which I will introduce the concept of symbols of transition in relation to the 7th century belt fittings which is further exemplified with a, case study, with a case study of three belt fittings from the Dutch province of Limburg. But before that, first some examples of these 7th century belt fittings. Uh, as you can see on this slide, the group consists of various iron belt mounds, ranging from back plates to belt buckles, which were originally attached to a leather belt. Their decorative patterns are rather complex, and often consist of interlacing bands in which animal uh, elements can be found. The Merovingian burial record uh, provides the most varied and extensive source of information for archaeologists of this period. It consists of a variety of objects next to the variety of grave cemetery, cemetery features. Um, the debate on these burial remains, however, is not yet fully connected to the historical debate on the rise of Christianity, which covers the same area and period. <coughs> this has a number of reasons. The old interpretive models, very briefly, uh, stated that the appearance of graves, of graves could indicate whether the individuals buried were pagan or Christian. It was thought that the empty graves, or those with objects which spray forth Christian symbols, and an east-west orientation were those of Christians, and that the richly furnished graves of otherwise oriented graves were those of pagans. It has, however, become clear that graves cannot be read like this. Richly furnished graves can be found in obvious Christian environments, and graves with so-called Christian characteristics can be found in cemeteries at some distance distance from Christian belief centers. But nonetheless, there are some seemingly obvious relations between the burial record and the expression of Christianity, such as objects with overt Christian signs, of which some examples are shown here. But interpretations other than the banal rejected direct assignment of Christian identities have not really been put forward yet. Well, to get a grip on the relation between um, the burial objects and Christianity, I chose to discuss the belt fittings with ornamental signs, of which it is undeniable that they had a strong symbolic meaning. The animal symbolism on the 7th century belt fittings is not as directly part of the early Christian iconography as the cross is, but they did circulate in a world where Christianity found its way. On the basis of this group of objects, I want to argue that there may be other ways of connecting the Merovingian burial record to the rise uh, of Christianity in Europe. Well, one way of making this connection is discussing these objects as signs of transition, for which a number of their specific characteristics are relevant to mention. First, 
this is about the 7th century belt fittings. First, their pre-burial circulation took place in a world in which Christianity, though in various degrees, was present. The animal style on these belts is dated to 580-700 and occurs on numbers of, others, uh, of other objects, not only on the belt fittings. The belt fittings, with animal style too, are considered to form a homogeneous group, spread in high numbers over large parts of Merovingian Europe. And they are also portable objects. These aspects enable a day-to-day -day interaction with the applied symbolic messages. In order to understand how the fittings and their symbolism worked in relation to the rise of Christianity, it is useful to focus on the processes of their production and widespread appropriation. For this purpose, I'm using these backplates of belts from the Dutch province of Limburg as a case study. Two of them were found in the cemetery underneath the Church of St. Sefatius in Maastricht, and one was found 30 kilometers, kilometers to the north of Maastricht, in a river close to the village of Heel. I chose these fittings, these three fittings, as a case study because they seem to be identical at first sight. This is indeed true when looking at their general composition. All the plates consist of a central H-shaped figure composed of a band-shaped body <coughs> which connects two heads of birds. The central ornaments are framed by two pairs of claws at the edges of the fittings and by decorative friezes. <clears throat> but, a closer, but a closer inspection reveals some differences between them. So there's not enough time to discuss, to discuss this variability in detail, but some examples can be mentioned here shortly. With regard to the execution of the body parts, uh, it is interesting to take a look at the claws on the three back plates. They, are, they, they show um, a red circle around them. The claws on the specimen from Hale are different from those on the two church specimens, and the claws on the church plates are, are similar but different in orientation as the positions of the upper toes show. With regard to the variation within the entire composition and the connections between the body parts, it can be noticed that the orientation of the composition on the church two back plate is only similar to the two other two when the plate is turned in a different position. Another interesting aspect relates to the curls behind the eyes which are difficult to identify as a specific uh, body, uh, animal body part. It is especially this part of the composition which shows the highest degree of variability in the way it is connected to the other body parts in the three compositions. Uh, the plate from Hill shows that these curl and in long extensions, for example, which are not present on the two other back plates and on the church two plate, it is, there is more than one option to connect the curls to the rest of the body. With regard to the quality of the plates, it can be stated that the church one plate is of the highest quality. The lines are rather neat, the bodies show more detail, and uh, the highest amount of silver was used on this plate. The quality of the ornamental schemes also relates to the connection between the body parts. More than one observed option for connections between body parts may indicate that the copyist of this image did not know what he was doing exactly on a very detailed level, which resulted in a product of a lesser quality, or we may uh, define it like that. Well, altogether, these examples show how a careful examination of the ornamental schemes can reveal a number of differences within a shared composition. How these noted differences can contribute to the understanding of the general production process of animal style tube belts will be discussed later on. But first, a few remarks on the special significance of the claws. Well, their significance can be illustrated with two sword belt mounts with claws, one from Lent and one uh, in, in the Netherlands that's number four, and one from Sivedale uh, in Italy, that's number five. The claws on these mounts are depicted as isolated animal body parts without any clear connection to a specific animal. 
it can be assumed that pu- the people must have recognized these as claws and understood the symbolic references of them as isolated body parts on objects. Moreover, the portrait claws are much alike the claws on the three belt fittings from Limburg, and these examples show that the range of individual body parts that were used in ornamental compositions were distribu- distributed over large areas, but that specific ornamental compositions may have had a regional signature. Well, on the basis of these observations, a few suggestions can be made with regard to the general organization of the production of the belt fittings and their widespread consumption in a world which saw the rise of Christianity. First, the context of their production. Since a high number of iron belt fittings with animal style two ornaments were found in Maastricht, it seems plausible to assume that at least one workshop was active here. The oldest discovered remains of the St. Sefatius Church in Maastricht date to the second half of the 6th century. And Maastricht was at least from that period on a center in which Christianity had a role. The workshop active in this center may therefore in one way or another have been associated with Christianity. But what about the rest of Gaul? The Christian landscape of early medieval Gaul will have mainly consisted of networked Christian cities and cloisters, and the city-based metal workshops may have functioned within this same network. The silversmith did not work in isolation, um, but was connected to a network of workshops and therefore knowledge about the proper design of animal ornaments. This network may have had a ranked constitution of well-connected city-based smiths in connection with Christianity and less or maybe not connected smiths of the countryside. And this constitution of the network may have been reflected in the quality differences between the belt fitting as discussed earlier on. And what about the consumption side of the story? It can be stated that the fittings were widely appreciated, since they are found in high numbers in graves on both rural and urban cemetery sites. The widespread, um, the widespread adoption of the fittings is related to a number of their characteristics. First, they are portable objects displaying signs that are more or less similar over large areas. It has become an almost universal symbolic language in 7th century Gaul, with, with, with which people interacted on a daily basis. They also have quite lavish a- appearances, for which in fact not that much material investment was required. The quantities of silver needed are limited, as are the quantities of copper alloy, which also has the advantage that it resembles gold. In this sense, the objects were accessible for many. But most important, uh, the animal symbolism on the fittings had the capacity to refer to both old and new worldviews. Animal style too was not a completely new invention, since animal symbolism was already abundantly present in society for a long time, uh, as other sorts of styles. However, animal style too started to occur frequently on an extensive range of obvious Christian objects, such as shrines and architectural church elements. But animal style too also occurs on hybrid objects with both Christian and pre-Christian references. Examples of such objects are, of course, the famous tele from Niederdollendorf, uh, as you can see here, but maybe also a strap end from the Alemannic region, which you can also see here, which depicts similar bird's head as on the fittings from Limburg, but in combination with a text with an obvious Christian reference. It seems thus that that animal style too became incorporated in a Christian pictorial world in the late 6th and 7th century, but that it was also used in non-Christian context. This gave the belt fittings the capacity to be appropriated, experienced and used in the way one wished. They could be fully embraced as objects belonging to a Christian world but a non-Christian or ambiguous attitude towards them was also an option, since it was possible to use the objects as an expression of a careful exploration of Christianity without dismissing older worldviews. <clears throat> as such, 
uh, the 7th century belt fittings from graves can be seen as symbols of transition. One was heading towards an all over acceptance of Christianity, but the stages of this transition were experienced differently all over early medieval Gaul. Objects as the belt fittings circulated in this changing world and were objects that matched with the different feelings one could have towards these changes. Well, it remains to be questioned whether other symbols of transition are also present in the burial record. The garnet disc brooches, for example, as mentioned earlier, can depict crosses or not. It may be the, um, the case that the garnet tradition was incorporated in the Christian pictorial world, which made it possible for these brooches without crosses, so those without crosses, to refer to both old and new worldviews, which makes them also symbols of transition. Thank you.